Welcome to this morning's fourth and final webinar in the silage series on feeding out and feeding testing. I'm Sophia Kizzi from the Education Team in Communication and Stakeholder Engagement at the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment and I'll be your host for today. I'd like to acknowledge that as we are meeting across the state in this virtual space, each of us stand upon the lands of many different nations. I'm meeting on Gadigal land and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waterway of the Aura Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters on which our online audiences join us from. Pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that to all First Nations colleagues and guests joining us. I'd now like to hand over to Sue Street, Livestock Senior Land Services Officer within Central West Local Land Services to formally introduce the session. Thanks Sophia. Um, so on behalf of Local Land Services, uh, we, welcome, we, we welcome you all today to the webinar. Um, this series of silage webinars is brought to you by the Local Land Services Ag Extension teams from across the state. So as was stated before, this is the final webinar of our series and today's topic is on feeding out and feed testing. Once again, I welcome John Pilts from New South Wales DPI who has partnered with us to share his wealth of knowledge and experience in this area as part of this webinar series. So John Pilts is a Livestock Research Officer at the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. John has more than 30 years experience in animal nutrition and fodder conservation he was the National Co-Coordinator of the Top Fodder Extension Program until 2005 and is the author of the Su Successful Silage Manual. So welcome today, Piltsy. Thank you, Sue, and thank you, everybody. Um, to this, our last webinar on silage making and feeding. Today, we're going to talk about feed out and feed testing. And the topics we're going to talk about are there's a range, and we'll discuss them in various parts across the presentation as they arise. And please ask questions as they arise. Um, we're going to look at aerobic spoilage and what causes it and management. We're also going to look at feed-out equipment that can be used for feeding silages, either as chopped silage or bales. We'll look at feed-out systems, wastage, additives, but which we'll pretty much restrict to just uh, inoculants and feed testing. One thing I hope we get from today, uh, I did notice in last week's presentation, the comment came across from Daryl that it looks like prison shop silage is, is sort of the ultimate to aim for. And it, in many ways it is. It, it's often the best in terms of fermentation, in terms of gloss, least losses and quality and also often the cheapest form of ensiling. But we might see a few options here that make us realise that within each individual system, people need to decide what will work for them. And so chopped silage is good, but there are some considerations why you would go that way versus bales. The first thing I want to talk about though is aerobic spoilage. Aerobic spoilage happens as soon as air penetrates silage at feed out. Now we're not talking about spoilage that occurred prior to opening, but we're going to limit ourselves to what happens at feed out. As soon as air gets in, in theory, you'll get some spoilage, some deterioration and decomposition. The rate at which that happens will vary from silage to silage, and we'll look at a couple of reasons why that's the case. But what we'd say is that a silage is considered to be unstable when it reaches a temperature that is 2 degrees above ambient and is increasing. So it's 2 plus degrees and it's increasing. Be aware that temperature in a silage bunker can actually rise to about 50 degrees purely and simply because of aerobic spoilage. And more importantly, that heating in very unstable silages will happen very, very quickly certainly within four to five hours for a very unstable silage. However, there are some silages, and they tend to be silages like lucens and clovers, where they could be stable for much, much longer, up to 10 days. 
Losses from aerobic spoilage vary a lot, but they can be quite high in terms of the loss of dry matter and the loss of nutrients. As you can imagine, you've got yeasts and moles working on the silage to cause aerobic spoilage and heating, and they're going to, as a preference, be using substrates that are highly digestible. So they will be breaking down sugars and other products that would be very digestible by livestock, and so they're lost. The other thing to consider is that when silages become hot, you'll get some rejection of, by livestock, so they won't eat as much. The intake will be down, and that can include an increase in wastage if you're, you're continuing to feed the same amount. However, a lot of people just consider it normal because throughout their whole um, silage feeding experience, heating is, occurs, and unfortunately, it, that's not uncommon but it's something we really try to avoid. There are a couple of tips that we can try and use to help, and we'll look at those as well. Firstly, factors that are, do make silage more or less unstable. If there's plenty of residual sugar, then the silage will be more, less stable. Unfortunately, if you have a very good, efficient silage preservation, silage fermentation, the sugars will be converted very efficiently to acids so there will be more sugars left over. Those silages will be less stable. Silages that start initially have a, a very high sugar content and we're looking at things like maize in particular or sweet sorghums, uh, even the grasses start with a lot of sugar so there's an opportunity there for quite a bit of sugar to be remaining after the fermentation at the point of feed out, which means there is an easy substrate for yeast and moles to start operating on, to start to consume and cause spoilage. Interestingly, if you look at silages have had a very poor fermentation, which is earmarked like we've said in previous webinars, long, slow fermentation, very inefficient, there's a lot of breakdown of sugar, there's breakdown of acids, and what effectively happens is you use up all the available sugar and that's when the fermentation generally stops. So they tend to be quite stable. But let's not go that way as an opportunity to, to end up with a better stability. The other management point is porosity. So air is necessary for spoilage, for heating. If the silage is not very well compacted, it becomes quite porous and there's a lot of air can penetrate, that will be less stable. And we'll look at a couple of factors throughout this talk about where that porosity can be managed or where it is a problem. And the other thing to remember is if you're going to get heating, you need yeast and moles present. If you have a very inefficient system where you're harvest and fill the bunker slowly or, uh, or bales don't get sealed quickly. So there's a lot of air allowed to operate on those that chopped silage before it's sealed. Then you will get more yeast and moles start to proliferate and therefore they'll be present when you open up the silage and you'll have a greater risk of them operating at a higher rate and more heating. The other things to consider is hot weather is going to increase the onset and rate of heating. It's something we can't do anything about, but if you're making a silage in a warmer, certainly more humid, northern type environment, and you're feeding out in summer, be aware that it'll probably heat more quickly and you need to manage for that. The thing we can do is one of the things we can do is look at feed out rate and we'll show you some data lately, later about how increasing the rate at which that silage is fed out, which is reducing the exposure to air and heating, reduces the rate of spoilage. Another one is how much that silage face is disturbed because that influences air penetration and we'll move on to a couple of examples of that shortly. And one that's often not considered, if 
you're feeding silage and you're feeding it in the system where you're putting in a mixer wagon and putting in some grain or putting in some other additives, if you once you dig that silage out and put it in the mixer wagon and feed it, it has become really highly aerated. It's also sitting in a big blob of material which can, um, allows a lot of the heat that's produced to be trapped in it. So you'll get quite substantial heating because you've put in a mixer wagon and aerated it. So the go with mixer wagons is if you're using them, mix, get the silage out and mix it and feed it out very quickly. That reduces the time at which um, between feed out and feeding but it also reduces the time in which it's just sitting in a great mass of material which allows heat to build up. So what we, what we can do, um, we can make sure that when we make our silage, we fill it quickly and we compact it well so that we've got to exclude as much air as we can and we, we're not too porous and we seal quickly. We'll look at a couple of options with additives. There are some that will certainly help unstable silages. We'll look at feed-out rates to make sure we get those adjusted to suit the silage type we, we're going to produce. Options to look at minimising the face disturbance, minimising the delay um, between removal and feeding, and increasing feeding frequency if the silage is unstable. So if you have an unstable... If you have a silage that's quite stable, you might feed every second day and allow the animals to consume it over a period of time. If it's a, if it's a loosen, that might be fine. It may even be fine for two or three days. But if it's a maze, it, wouldn't be, it would not be recommended that you would do that. You need to feed more quickly. So let's have a look at a couple of pictures. This is what I call a poorly managed face. To one degree, it's a little bit harder to manage because it's a longer fibre, but you'll see that there's loose material laying everywhere. It's, it's an uneven sort of face to look at. It's not smooth. All the material down the bottom has obviously fallen out and it's just laying there. And so that's had a lot of air penetrated. It will be sitting there as a, a mass that will start to heat and be trapped under the plastic if you if, or just sitting there either way it'll it'll heat and the air will penetrate into lots of that material because of the uneven surface if we compare that to this now granted it's maize and it's a lot finer chop what's happened here is they've used a piece of equipment that has effectively shaved that material so that there is no disturbance of the face it's quite hard, it's quite smooth, and there's nowhere for the air to penetrate other than just the surface that it's, that's exposed. It may seem not that important, but I can tell you based on anecdotal evidence and some of the data I'll show you, that it makes a really big difference. This is American data. It's May solid. So we're starting with something that's more unstable but if you look at the graph you'll see there's effectively three layers three levels of compaction the top line the blue line is very loose the middle line is categorized as loose and the bottom line is probably where we need to be it's a nice firm compacted silage what you'll see that after one day's exposure there's a little bit of difference but generally the losses are very very small but as the number of days that that silage is exposed increases, you will notice that the amount of losses build up quite substantially. In a practical sense, there is obviously their compaction at the time you make the silage is very important. But the other thing is we don't want that silage sitting around for three or four days before we feed it out. Even with a well-compacted silage, we're still getting 5% losses. So that comes back to what we were talking about last week. You make the silage face narrow rather than wide, and you adjust it 
so that the amount of material can be moved back at each feed out um, to effectively say no part of the silage, silage face is exposed for a long period of time. If we look at machinery to get that nice smooth face, there's a few options and I'm only going to show a couple here. But at the cheaper end, we've got something like this. It's called a block cutter and it operates pretty simply. You drive it in just like a normal forklift and then you close the, the um, cutter down. It cuts the material out in a block and that tends to leave it as a nice smooth face. Word here, if you don't have access to this equipment and you're using just a front end loader with a bucket, which is not uncommon, you need to be especially careful when you're trying to get that material out. Now, the tendency, and a lot of us will probably have seen it, is when you come to feed out, someone goes in with a bucket, rams it as hard as they can into the silage face, lifts it up and shakes it so the silage falls in. What's happening there is there will be material getting loose and falling down everywhere, which you can pick up later. But the other thing is by ramming it in and lifting it up like that, you're creating um, lines where the material has lifted and the air can penetrate in, little fracture lines that can go back. And I've seen this, well, there's no data on it, I've seen anecdotally how the difference between a well-managed face versus a face that's managed in that way can make a big difference. If you need to use a bucket, the recommendation is you use the, the tip or the blade of the bucket to knock some material down as in a cutting type action onto the floor and then gently pick it up and take it away rather than that ramming in and lifting and shaking which is going to have fracture lines back into the silage. There are other bits of gear like um, uh, which operate on a, a cutting type mechanism. There are shear grabs and others. But this is probably at the lower end, probably one of the options that would be most suited for most people. At the top end, where you're talking about people who are feeding a lot of silage, like in a, a feedlot or a dairy or something, we'll actually look at this is a rotating drum cutter, which is responsible for that nice face. So it'll go through and it will cut the material, shave it off, basically into a wagon, which it can then be fed out. Does a fantastic job in terms of a nice face. But again, when we need to make our system, we need to consider what we're going to do and how what's going to work for us. This is top end, May silage, big systems, big throughputs. Quickly, I'd just like to come back to this table, which I did briefly show last week with about additives. What we said last week was additives generally lead to a faster, more efficient fermentation. There's more sugar left, which is why they're less stable. But there is a, an inoculant out at the moment called Lactobacillus buckneri. And you'll just hear it referred to as buckneri. Buckneri has been selected because it seems to impart a degree of stability into the silage, which allows it to remain stable without heating for a longer period of time. If we, if we look at this example, and it's corn silage, maize silage, so it's going to be very unstable, dry matter con around that 30 to 32%, percent so a little bit wetter than we would normally say is ideal. pHs both well preserved, you know, 3.6, 3.7. Ammonia nitrogen is very similar, but look at the difference in aerobic stability. The untreated silage had begun to heat, that two degrees plus two degrees above ambient within 18 and a half hours, whereas the inoculated silage had been 43 and a half. In a practical sense, if you're feeding every day, if you get material that's going to heat in 18 and a half hours, it will be hot by the time that 24 hour period and that uh, intake period is finished. And you don't want to do that. Whereas the inoculated silage will still be quite stable. Now there's a lot of speculation about exactly how Buckner works, but 
it does produce other products apart from lactic acid, which in, uh, generally seem to increase stability, other acids. Uh, it does that in a unique way in that it's quite slow. It happens later in the fermentation. So you still get your very efficient fermentation up front, but then you get some production of these stabilizing products. In terms of animal production then, which is going back, I know we discussed this briefly last week, intake has gone up from 903 to 935. There has been a significant increase in live weight gain. Primarily, I would attribute that to the fact that that additional 32 grams is all going into production. All the maintenance requirements I met before. We will see later that there are examples that it may also be to do with the efficiency at which that silage is used. So, we worked out um, some stability is different silages have different it's layers of stability. Now, most of this talk at this part will all be about chopped silages because it's more relevant in many senses. But these are some general guidelines which are in the manual. So if, if we had an unstable silage, so that's going to heat very quickly, a maize or a sweet sorghum, or even a very high sugar ryegrass or a very high sugar drought-affected cereal crop, you'd be looking at that 30 centimetres a day removal. You remove a foot a day. That's from all the way across the face. In terms of moderately stable, you know, so it's not going to heat for three days, your more traditional sort of um, pasture silages with, with um, grass content, you, you, you can see that it just comes back. And they're very stable silages, which are either poorly fermented or tend to be things like lucerne and some of the clovers which start off with low sugar content, so they're not, there's not a lot of residual sugar. If they're made well, they're compacted well, there's very little use of moss. They tend to be quite stable. In terms of the bales, general rule of thumb is one layer of bales every two days. But, again, that's um, probably accounting for the fact that uh, most, stable, most silages would be classed as moderately stable, I doubt there'd be very many unstable bales, but it, it's probably going back faster than, or slightly faster than required for, say, a loosen. Thanks, Paul. I notice a note there about Buckner Eye. That's a real big spoilage. The other time when we have losses in a feed-out system is wastage. Pretty obvious, and I hear lots of different anecdotal stories about it, but essentially wastage is trampling and spoilage by livestock of silage. So you feed it out and they walk all over it, they camp it, camp on it, they urinate, they defecate all over it, and then obviously they're not really that willing to eat it. If you overfeed and get unconsumed silage, that's going to be worse. But different feed-out systems will allow you to minimise those wastes, waste. So we're going to look at what constitutes a feed-out system. So first thing I've got there is self-feeding, hot wires, bales on the ground, um, in a trailer, round bale feeder, square bale feeder or your system with a your upmarket system with a forage wagon or mixer wagon. Now we'll go through each of those individually and look at some of the pros and cons. Uh, Dale, good point. What's the stability of bale solids considering the bale is only exposed to the air on the outside? Look, it's they're generally pretty stable. The the only bales that I've seen that I would class as moderately or less than moderately stable would be those um, very high sugar type silages where you have, uh, for example, a high, very high sugar ryegrass or a drought stress cereal or something like that. Remembering though, if you cut, cut that material, bale it, seal it pretty quickly, it's had very little opportunity for yeast and moles to grow, so it should be pretty stable. 
if if you have a high sugar bale and it's been allowed to sit around for several hours or, or unfortunately some cases cases a day and it gets quite warm those yeast and molds will be there and i have seen bale silages that will heat reasonably quickly but they're not that common with good management it shouldn't happen so the first one we want to look at and this is this is pretty traditional um, this is actually a hay bale but the concepts the same often when people start with silage they may want to go down a system where they're just feeding bales because they have the equipment it's lo and they don't have to spend any money. Now, it's pretty low cost. It allows you to move around and feed wherever you want to feed. But it is the system which has got the highest wastage. It's, you can't get away from that. Um, I know that often, you will often hear, for example, uh, I fed the hay in the drought and they licked it all up. And I'm not saying that that isn't the case but what I'm saying is that it's often hard to completely measure what they don't eat but in a drought you're tending to feed an amount that's only required for maintenance so they can eat it very quickly and you're also tending to feed on dry hard soil so the op options there are for animals to really cause a lot of wastage by camping are pretty low um, if you use this system, as some people do, where you've got animals that are grazing and it's a supplement on the bales that's out there for two or three days, then these losses can be high. And estimates of over 50% of the bale being wasted are not uncommon. And if you look at that bale, you can see there's still a lot of bale left, but there's a hell of a lot that's spread out and it, it's not going to be consumed. The other thing to consider when we're looking at our system is depending on what equipment you have, if you're just using forks on a tractor, bales can be pretty slow if you're feeding out a lot. If you're not feeding out much, it works fine. One of the ways to increase intake can be to spread the material out. So you're not looking at all the animals crowded about one little bale trying to eat as much as they can and they're competing for space. So we can either use one of these unwinding material uh, machines and you just unroll the bale if it's a round bale. What you'll see though is it doesn't get away from that risk of trampling and spoilage. You could use one of these choppers, um, work fine, same deal. They'll, they'll run it out in a windrow. Access will go up and access will, will mean that you, you're more likely to be using this for a production feed. But Again, it's still open to, and if it's production feed, certainly will be feeding more than they require in a short space of time, you will get wastage. But the view is of ground, windrow, you don't have to pay for feed troughs. You, don't, you can move when you want to. You can move in such a way that there's very little damage to pastures and accessibility is good. Now, there are a few other ways too. If you were, for example, to feed under... Um, under a hot wire or along a fence or something, you can reduce those. And we'll have a look at a picture in a minute. The, it does inquire, require a little bit more investment in, in equipment. and um, But in the scheme of things, it's, it's probably not great and something you need to weigh on. Um, as I said, one of the options, if you want to stop that wastage, is you can use hot wires like this and try and feed the cows. Or, or sh sheep are probably going to be more difficult, but along a fence line might be more appropriate for sheep. Even if you lay a little bit of rubber matting along uh, to, along the fence and, and then feed onto that matting so that animals are less able to walk across it, so they're less likely to camp on it and all the rest of it. You, whatever, what it, there, there's so many options, um, and you need to pick what you what you um, can achieve or what works for you. Look, if we if we go to one of these, um, and again we're concentrating on bales, but if we're looking at uh, a low waste system, you've got feeders like this. There are a range of them. I'm not going to advocate one or the other. 
This is a feeder that's been developed by the department um, at Cowra. It has the, um, it's unique in that the side moves, if you look at the picture with the sheep on it, the side on the right hand side actually comes in on a spring so that that's overcomes that problem with sheep not being able to reach far into the centre of a bar. This system was um, compared and, uh, and looked at what the sort of losses were with that and um, with feeding on the ground. And I'm just, what I'll do now is I'll actually look at two examples comparing the losses between and the production between feeding on the ground or feeding in a ring feeder. The first example is hay from West, and it's from Western Australian experiment. And same hay, and effectively they fed the hay on the ground where it could be trampled, or they fed it in a ring feeder. Ring feeders aren't perfect, as we know. You still get losses because they drag some out. But look at look at the impacts of one versus the other. Significantly higher live weight gain in the feeder. I attribute that to the fact that if we see hay in a paddock, we don't put any more hay out till we consider it's gone or they're not going to consume anymore. So if we've fed hay and the animals have trampled on it and they're really not that interested in eating it, then they will leave it. So their intake goes down, therefore their live weight gain goes down. But at the other side of the coin, if you look at the amount of hay fed, you will see that you're fed more on the ground than in the ring feeder. So what, what we're getting is a two-edged sword here. There's a lot of hay fed and it's dragged out and wasted or blows away and so therefore you don't notice it being utilised and yet you're putting out more but they're eating less and they probably eat more if you put it out more sooner when, you could, when they could avoid more of the wasted or spoilt material, but then your hay that you use would also go up. But the net effect is, look at the amount of hay that was fed in one versus the other and the cost per head and the cost of gain in cents per kilogram. It's a no-brainer. If you can use a ring feeder or some similar type of arrangement, you'll be well ahead in terms of production and also in terms of reduced costs. If we look at the data from the Cowra experiment, which was using the feeder that we looked at a couple of slides back, this was a loosened silage that was either fed in the Cowra feeder, it was fed on the ground, and it was, or it was fed in, chopped into a Cowra feeder. So, Cara feeder and on ground were just bales. You'll see there that uh, intake of the in the cara feeder and the top feeder were higher. But look at the other thing, the wastage. The wastage in the cara feeder and the wastage chopped into the cara feeder were around that 14 or 10 percent. So 10 or 14 percent of the bales weren't wasted but 45% of the bale were wasted when you feed it, fed it on ground. Now, if you consider the bale silage is more expensive, tends to be a more expensive option, and you consider that individually wrapped bales um, tend to be a more expensive option, and there's rounds versus squares. So if you've got round wrapped bales and you're paying... $150 a tonne dry matter to produce that and you lose 45 or 50%, all of a sudden the value of that feed or the cost of that feed has effectively doubled. So it's gone from $150 to $300 a tonne dry matter, which makes it extremely expensive compared to a lot of other products. Often we would say over the years, if you choose to go into silage or try silage within your system, you're not going to go and spend a lot of money initially. You want to see how it works. So there's a few options with which you can do that. But we would also say the first dollar you spend in terms of your silage system might be more efficiently fed 
spent on your feed out equipment and your feed out system rather than buying the equipment to make the silage in the first place. If you, if you, if you have access to good contractors who can come and do the job for you quickly and efficiently, you're probably not going to really notice the difference. But if you are wasting a lot of the material that you make through the poor feed-out equipment, then maybe that's where you should spend your first dollar. If we go back to chop silages, look, this is self-feeding. And there's a few people do it, and I've seen a couple of people do it quite successfully. The pros for self-feeding are it, you don't need a lot of equipment because essentially it's there and the animals do the work and there's no labour. The cons are that the face width limits the number of animals fed. In wet conditions, and we go back to that slide, you can see it's a little bit boggy, but in wet conditions... You can, your wastage can be quite high. You need to move the barriers regularly. Okay, that's that's probably a minor thing. But the other consideration is the height of the face. So you, you generally have to make a face that is relatively low. So your depth of silage is relatively low, which means the amount of plastic per unit of silage is, is higher than normal. It also means that if there's holes in the top of the plastic, you're going to get more penetration or the air will penetrate a proportionally more of the silage and you could get more waste. But as I said, have seen situations where this has been done for production feeding of steers, works well. Generally, I would say if you're going to do it, stick to um, a summer type environment where your ground's generally going to be dry anyway. Here's another option, and look, I don't particularly endorse one sort of trailer or the other. There's a few variations that I've seen over the years. This is this is a, or was a quite a successful dairying operation down on the south coast, and because animals, uh, dairy cows, were being moved regularly from paddock to paddock, they would put this silage onto carts, and they would drive it around, and they would drop it off as required. Two, pad two trailers here, four here, whatever they needed, and the animals would help themselves. Obviously, the limitations are animals have to be big enough to be able to reach that high and, and reach into the middle, so your trailers have got to be appropriate. Probably always going to be better for cows than it will be for something like sheep or small calves, but it, it is an option. It, it also um, allows you to effectively have troughs but also have feed-out wagon equipment at the same time. They, I think we've pretty much got that. It's yeah, easy to build, maintain. Um, you can use them for piddle bale silage. You obviously just change accordingly. Probably, um, well, most of the ones I've ever seen are about, uh, pit silages, but it doesn't really matter. And ultimately, the feed trough. And whether that's a, a concrete job on the left or a, a combined building one on the right, what you're going to get with that is a lot of reduction in wastage, soil in contamination. Animals can't walk on it and so on and so forth. It's pretty obvious. So rather than up to 50% in a paddock setup, you may be down 1% or 2%. Those sort of setups are also ideal if you're looking at production feeding of animals where you want to mix rations. So you have to have equipment that, that's going to mix a ration that you want to feed. If you're going to go to that amount of um, input, both in terms of cost of equipment, you're really going to be looking at feeding animals for production. So therefore, you're going to make, you, to do it properly, you really need to make sure that you get the most efficient use out of the silage they do require cleaning out though. if the silage does become hot um, then it, it not only becomes unpalatable and they won't eat it 
It also serves as a source of contamination to new material that you put in over the top. So if you can imagine a mouldy lump of silage, which has got a lot of mould, yeast spores sort of ready to, to spread, and you put more silage over the top, it will contaminate, which will mean that the new material will also go off quite quickly. So better off, make sure when it, that seems to build up, just clear it out of the way. Some are easier to do than others. The, the um, final slide I want to show you here is, this is dairy cows, it's New Zealand research, and it's looking at silage fed in the ground in a paddock versus silage fed on a, in a trough in a yard and the wastage from the two systems. So same silage fed in the ground, 23% loss is estimated. So, silage fed in the trough, 6.1% losses. Quite significant. Now, I'll, I'll um, give you an anecdote here. That when part of the silage stuff that we've done several years ago, or quite a few years ago, we dealt, we were working with a dairy farmer down, down around Warrnambool who had decided to uh, produce or, or build a feed pad to feed his cows with the main aim to to get them off paddocks in the wet cold winters so that they weren't padding up there pugging up the paddocks and the, um, he didn't need to re renovate and reseed all the time his experience was that um, he went from feeding eight carts a day of silage to five carts a day in, of silage with absolutely no impact on production in terms of milk per day liters of milk per day what that meant was effectively th three out of eight carts of silage on the paddock, and he admitted himself he would not have picked it, three out of eight carts were being wasted by pugging, um, being pushed into the ground and, and just uneaten. So that's, that systems we can use. I'd like to now just go on to effective chop length on intake and this is this is a an interesting topic because traditionally we've looked at effective chop length on intake by uh, using ch uh, either precision chop or forage wagon material this is results from six studies in france where they had two grass and four loosened silages and they produced the silages and then they took the silage and either fed it or they chopped it into finer lengths and then fed it. So the purpose of doing that was so that the chop length didn't influence the fermentation quality. And what you can see there is a clear improvement in intake with chopping versus without chopping. So we would have said and still say for chopped silages, if you want to maximise intake and you really want to get production feeding, then it is worth making sure the chop length is small. So that does, in one sense, mean systems that are got long chop length are not going to be as efficient or as effective. This this is another study. Um, now, this gets back to, because it's European stuff, um, to make the silages, the fermentation quality, to ensure decent fermentation quality, they, they ensile them with acid, which is traditional, to ensure the pH drops quickly and preservation occurs. And you'll see there that all the pHs are very, very similar. And there's a lot of data there, which people can look at over time. But effectively, you've got unchopped, single chop flail, which is an older type machine, double chop flail, precision chop, long or medium. And in terms of intake, you'll see that as we go from left, unchopped, across to medium chop, the finest of the finest of the silages that we've got there, the intake goes from five hundred and seventy two to over a kilo a day, over 1,100 grams a day. So that's a significant increase in dry matter intake. 
if we drop down two more lines, we'll see that the energy intake has gone from 6.4 to 12.8 megajoules per day. That's translated in the next line into going from a loss of 3 grams per day up to a gain of 151 grams a day. So if you look at this and you look at the previous slide, it was um, always viewed, believed that, or, or it was always recommended shorter chop was going to be the way to go, and particularly for sheep and particularly for small calves. Once you get to cows, it appears to be less of an issue, but that which is understandable because as as animals pick up long strands they've got to chew it up to to swallow it what's a long strand to a sheep is not a long strand to a cow then in several years ago at cara we conducted experiment an experiment where we looked at a conventional round baler which we fed as a bale versus we chopped it at feeding. A chopping round baler, which cuts the material quite unevenly, but probably on average, in theory, about seven and a half centimetres long. A large squared baler, which didn't cut, and precision chop. So you can see that the average particle lengths, you know, for the, obviously, for the unchopped round and the large square, they're 420. Um, at feeding, we got it down to 15, which was similar to um, the precision chop. And the chopping round bar, in this case, turned out mm -hmm. about a 90 millimetre or 9 centimetre chop length. Most things were reasonably similar, with the exception of, um, you know, the dry matter is, you know, varies a little bit, but you wouldn't con consider them a real problem one way or the other. Um, the, the ammonia nitrogens, we look down there, the ammonia nitrogens are probably the one that is a little bit concerning and, and to, to consider when looking at this information. At 14.2% in the precision job, it's higher than for the bales. So it's going to be less palatable. So they're going to consume less. But interestingly, the tested ME was higher for that precision chop than it was for the bale, which is potentially attributable to loss of leaf in the paddock. But you can't confirm that. Now, if if you look at intake, you'll see that yeah, precision chop was a little bit lower. Live weight gain, a little bit lower on the precision chop. The others were variable. Um, and you look at the large square versus the round bale, you know, 143 versus 151 for the square. They got the 420 millimetre particle length. The chopping, chopped at feeding with the 15, it's 159. Whereas the chopping round, round bala, which was uh, 90, it's 140. So what we're seeing here is that the precision chop silage fermentation quality is probably a bit low or a bit poorer, or it was poorer than the others, which probably depressed intake. But overall, we found that chopped and unchopped bales, or bale silages that were fed as a unit, without chopping, supported a similar level of production to what you would expect from a chopped silage. And that was attributed to the fact that sheep have the capacity to graze a bale. So... Effectively, while a sheep can chew on, pick the bits off a bale, it's doing exactly what it's doing in the paddock. It's picking and out little pieces, and by being held in the bale, that material is being broken down in particle size more easily than if they had to pick the material up and chew it. So that would say, on one hand, if you're feeding sheep in and they've got access to bales, they're probably going to find it easier to reduce the particle length than if that material was loose. But there is another consideration, and that is how many sheep can you feed around a bale? How much does access restrict intake? 
which then, having looked at all these different things, I mean that when we're wanting to de design a feed-out system, we need to look at a whole range of things. We need to consider what we want to do. So if my only aim is to produce silage to keep cows in reasonable condition over winter, then my goals are completely different to if I want to production feed lambs for sale at you know 50 kilo live weight or something. We need to consider how many animals we've got to because that's going to influence uh, firstly the size of the, any operation that we use but um, without actually really going into economics because uh, it, you can imagine that uh, what works in one system with 50 cows is not what works in one system with 300 cows. Where we put our silage. So if we decide that we always want to feed out on a, on a rocky hill which is suitable for containment feeding and, and various other um, enterprises, that's where we should put our silage. How does that, um, and how does that feed out site suit with a good location for storage? And we have to consider our facilities and equipment and potential to improve, which is why, um, which is why that lots of different systems can work. And even if um, there are some negatives, for example, with bales versus chop, there are some advantages in bales versus chopped as well. Now the question is, is chop length not so important at higher dry matter? I, I wouldn't say, um, dry matter would have any impact that it's just uh, probably a case of that if you if you look at high dry matter silages they tend to be bale silages uh, um, and lower dry matter silages tend to be chopped silages I, I wouldn't I wouldn't conclude that the chop length um, in and dry matter per se it, it's important um, because of dry matter per se I think they just it's just what happens so, given all that, this is our options. We've got round bale silage, we've got chop silage. We can have a chopping baler or a standard baler. We've got a long chop or a precision chop. And then we can either feed the bale as it is, feed it um, out loose. We can chop it prior to feeding. We can self-feed the chop material. We can put it in a block for using a shear grab or a block cutter. We can self-feed the or we can feed it loose. So you can see there's lots and lots of options. And what's going to work is partly going to depend upon what your preference is. For example, the classic would be a dairy farm who wants to be able to move his cows from one paddock to another very short rotations, but be able to feed long chop bale silage so that they can a bit of roughage and they want to be able to individual bales suit them because they can move from paddock to paddock every second day. If you if you are on the other hand trying to maximize production in a beef and sheep enterprise then what you're really going to be looking at are things like uh, maximizing intake. So you want to get in simple terms if we go back to the first webinar you want to get as much energy down an animal's throat as you can in a day because the more energy provided the protein and the minerals and that are all balanced that's when you're going to maximize production we have to be aware that about the form of the feed loose or bale so that can have an impact but intake intake can also be restricted if they can't access it so we get back to that whole issue of sheep may be able to graze a bale, but can they graze enough of it if there is a lot of sheep around one bale? If you think that a square bale has got 250 kilos of dry matter in it, and you've got lambs that are able to consume a kilo of dry matter a day of that material, that effectively means that for every day, one bale would feed those lambs. And try and imagine 250 lambs around one bale is a little bit hard. Even if you then say, well, it's going to last three days, you're then talking about still um, almost 100 or 80-something lambs around those, each of those bales. 
So there are some guidelines in the manual. I know LLS have guidelines. Um, a lot of the guidelines are based on limited data, often overseas data, and anecdotal evidence. And in many cases, they're designed for, particularly with sheep, they're designed for animals that are being fed a grain-based ration. You could probably something say in many cases cattle are not that dissimilar. And just remember the amount of space needed for a grain-based ration where they can consume the material more quickly is less than if it's a roughage ration. So these are the ones that we've pulled together for silage, you know, 24 hour access. You need 15, and these are effectively think about it as, as in a trough and then try and in your mind work around it for, cat, for a, a bale. 15 centimetres for young stock and 20, for 20 centimetres for, for mature cattle. That's if they can graze on that bale or that trough 24-7. If it's limited, you need to up it. If you talk about sheep, similarly, 24-hour um, access, and this is really um, the, the le depth of our data, this is what you're, you're looking at, 9 to 11 centimetres per mature animal and probably around that 15 centimetres for lambs and pregnant ewes. But I would always advise if you are looking to feed animals, it is critical as one of your management that you regularly weigh because it's very easy over a short period of time to, for animals to not gain at the rate you want or even lose weight without you visually visually noticing it. So, you know, if if steers after a couple of weeks have gained no weight or worse, lost 5 or 10 kilos, you're not going to pick that up by looking at them. But if you weigh them, you will notice it. So, you know, make weighing a regular part and adjust accordingly. And that may be increasing trough space or increasing bales, but it might also be that you need to cut the number of animals down more make some other arrangements and on that uh, was just another anecdote we did um, several years ago again was we came in contact with a beef producer from up in the central west who was feeding loosened silages in bales to cows just sorry to steers and he was trying to production feed and we'd recently fed a loosened silage here to to steers of similar live weight. The quality of the silage we had in terms of energy and protein was less than the quality of the silage that that person was feeding, yet our production was significantly higher in terms of live weight gain per day. After talking through the whole process, it became apparent that their animals that were grazing these bales in, a, in ring feeders were consuming considerably less than the animals that we were feeding where they were individually penned because it was an experiment and they had access to chopped silage 24 hours a day. The conclusion from that can only be that in that case it wasn't quality but it was purely access that reduced production. So if you go to the hassle of making a really good quality silage regardless of the form and your cattle don't get access or sufficient access, you will depress production and you will end up saying, I'm not going to touch silage, I'm disappointed with silage, it's only good for maintenance or whatever. It's certainly not going to achieve what I want to achieve. So this is this is my one and only foray into the world of economics in this. There is there is some information in the manual which talks about the principles about how you cost out systems and what sort of things you need to consider when you're um, assessing the type of farming system or silage system that you need to have or what's going to suit you the best. It, now, the figures have changed over the years. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, there are really no good, accurate, up-to-date figures on the costs of making silage, feeding silage and all the equipment. The best you, I can suggest is talk to 
to other people that have done it, talk to contractors and see what your costs are in terms of production. Look at the costs of feeding. Look at um, what the various equipment is reported to do in terms of rates of feed out. All I can, and that's about it. You know, it would be really good if we had that data, and I think it would be really good so that, firstly, people can go and make a reasonable economic decision about what system is going to work for them. But also be ha handy if you go to your bank manager and say, I want how many thousand dollars so I can buy this bit of equipment. It's going to come back in the end. It's going to reward me in terms of additional production. And, and you can start to talk about actual costs and potential benefits. So if we just simplify it, though, we look here, you've got round bale, forklift, paddock feeding, or whatever system. The issue with that is for every kilo of feed, the labour cost is high. If you're just running it out on a set of forks, but it costs a lot. You've probably got the tractor. Um, you, you, you've got to get a set of forks maybe if you haven't got one already, and a lot of people do, and you've got a higher wastage. If you go to the other end, you're looking at large forage wagons and you've got to have the equipment and the troughs. You know. Labour cost is generally pretty low. If you can work on using full loads, you can get a lot of material into a cart and get it out pretty quickly. But your costs of machinery are going to be high. Your waste is just going to be low. So if you can see that there's a lot of thought got to go into the system you want. You know, if, As I said, if it's just feeding cows over winter, you're probably not going to be interested in a very expensive system. If you're, if you're looking at finishing off you know, five or 600 steers a year in a small little feedlot, then maybe the other option has some merit to you. I also want to chuck in that one of the changes is probably, uh, or oh, it's not that new now, is the advent of square bars. Because square bars, compared to the traditional data that you may have seen about costs years ago, square bars are different. Production rates are much higher. Cost per bales, I'm not saying, I, I, you know, you'd need to check how for your system, but in terms of the amount of material that you could use, you could move in a day and process, it's going to be higher. If you simply said square bale, twice the, feet, twice the rate of uh, bar, a round bale in terms of tons of dry matter per hour, you can see you can become a lot more efficient. The other thing with square bales is they're a little bit more convenient if you're going to start moving them around. So if you, for example, have a mob 15 k's down the road and you want to go and feed them, square bars sit on a truck pretty well. You can rope them down without a lot of trouble. Um, round bars, not too bad, but if you're particularly if you're going to have all those square bars, sorry, all those round bars individually wrapped or tube line wrapper, there's a lot of uh, wastage, a lot of cost in plastic. Square bars you can put in a pit. So you know, all considerations. The last thing you'd really want to do is if you're feeding another mob 15 k's down the road, you don't want to start dragging forage wagons and feed out carts. It becomes quite slow and quite expensive. Um, Scott, it's a good comment. It's exactly right. And unfortunately, one of the things that go into the, the investment is knowing some really good data on costs and fee rates and all the rest of it. And unfortunately, we there have been in the past people who have done that work, but it's so out of date now. It's just, uh, it's out of date because costs have changed and it's also out of date because um, the, our machinery, our equipment has become a lot better and a lot more efficient. So, yeah, it would be good if someone was able to, to pursue that whole economics to another to, and, and get some really good um, recommendations out. Look, but just just for um, people that aren't familiar with them, this is this is a feed out, just a forage cart. Can be used for carting silage to the bunker as well as feeding out. You'll see on the picture on the left, there's a little flap. Well, that can come up so you can feed out in a windrow. Whereas at the back, that door opens, and you'll you'll see there's a chain there. It's a it's a the, 
walking floor so it can be made to walk backwards so if if it's walking backwards and that back gate's open you can use it to fill a silage pit if you want to use um, the feed out through the front through that flap there's a little walking floor that goes across and then that main part of the floor works in reverse so it's effectively dropping material onto that little walking floor and it's fed out into a windrow if, if you're serious and you want to get into the game, well, mixer wagons um, are obviously the ultimate and you can get them so that they weigh, so you can put whatever ingredients you want and all the rest of it. There was a time when forage equipment like this, particularly forage, forage carts rather than mixer wagons, was really cheap secondhand, but if, I think... Um, um, I think that, yeah, those days are they've gone. <laughs> Look, large square bales are much more efficient on larger properties. Daryl, what what you're saying is is exactly a case of each property and each system has its own unique considerations, and you you're made to make a decision based on what is going to work best for you. The other advantage of bales is it is less investment initially in terms of feed-out equipment and so um, you're not likely to be caught with a big bill that may or may not in the end be what you really... It's not really the production pathway you want to go down. Now, finally, we've got 23 minutes to go. I've got a couple of little questions. Um, once the pit is open, how how does often quick the silage go off, and how far in terms of palatability? Um, look, that's I think we've sort of discussed that um, palatability of maize silage. Generally, maize silage is quite palatable. The, the the issues with maize silage is it does heat quickly. When when it heats, it will become um, less palatable, and you will. Your production will fall due to the thing, the mycotoxins produced by those yeasts and mold when in that breakdown process. Uh, we we did some work here years ago looking at the same maize fed out the day it was dug out was fed out the day after it was dug out. So differences one had been allowed to heat, one hadn't, and there was a significant drop in intake when it was fed to steers. The other thing to remember with maize silage is very, very low in protein and low in minerals. So um, if you really want to get the most out of your maize silage, which should be reasonably high in MA, you need to supplement with those with protein and you need to supplement with minerals or you need to supplement you know, in a mix with, say, loosen or something. Otherwise, that could depress intake. How many tonnes per hectare would you need to make the silage process viable and cost effective? My rule of thumb is probably if it's under two tonnes, you wouldn't look at it. If it's over two tonnes, it will depend whether or not you think the material is so thin that once you cut it, uh, when you try to bale it it's, or break it or do anything with it, you're just going to have massive losses. So, so I, I suppose I'd say... Uh, there is no, well, I'd say there's, there's no real good evidence and no good data apart from a little bit that was done at Walker that showed that under two tonnes, the losses in canola systems was in a drought year was quite high. Um, so so that's, two tonnes is sort of like a benchmark, but just be aware, if it's two tonnes and it's quite long, you're going to lose less of it than if it's two tonnes and it's only four inches high because that's going to be really high to rake up. The other consideration if you've got those really light crops is you probably don't want to spread them out too much. You can probably get away with with a, um, a, a less efficient setup for wilting because they kind of go dry pretty quickly anyway. The, the, the other part is, and it sounds a bit um, left field, but if you've got very light crops and they become quite dry and you get a lot substantial wind, they will blow away. So your losses will then obviously go up. So if if it's a small crop, low yield, 
I would tend to rake them into a, not not spread them out too much and rake them into a window a bit earlier than normal based on dry matter content. Um, if you've suffered mice damage to the plastic, how much spoilage is too much in bales? Well, it's a bit of a how long piece of string question because uh, any spoilage is a loss um, and any spoilage does run a health risk. So the, m the more damage, the more losses, but the extent of the losses is probably going to be in part the length of exposure as well as the size of exposure to, to air from outside. In terms of the mice per se, um, I'm not so much worried about them other than to say if mice die in a bale, there is a potential for um, Clostridia to, to develop. But just so Clostridia it will start in that mouse, so that mouse will become toxic. If, if they produce the toxin, if those bacteria produce a toxin, um, you... you um, you can end up with a quite a toxic product. So that's probably a vague answer to say um, any mould's bad, the more mould's worse, but dead mice do present that risk of botulism. Now, the last little bit we're going to talk about is um, why test silage? I'm ahead of myself. Well, look. We, we want to know what our silage is going to deliver for us so that we can say this is going to be good for, for production feeding or this is only ever going to be good for, for maintaining cows and if we're going to use that as part of a ra ration for steers or part of a ration for lambs, we need, to, we need to bolster it with some grain or something. It also has a role in people putting a QA system in place. So if you're if you're saying I want to make a pasta silage and my target is an ME of ten and a half and a protein of fifteen and pH and ME of uh, uh, pH and ammonia of you know so ammonia of less than five, the feed test will say to you, yes I achieved it or no I didn't. And if you didn't, you can start to think back. And it's good to write notes, but think back and say this may or may not have been an issue. If, um, and obviously the obvious one, you know, if you're going to try and cut or value silage, you, you need to know what the quality is. So that even comes into that whole economics thing. Um, we sort of skip the step by saying uh, how much does it cost to make and what's the value of the production. But there's that intermediate of what's the value of the silage and what could I sell it for if I choose not to potentially use it for cattle or for sheep. If... If you're going to sample silage, and it's the same for everything, the bottom line is the sample's got to be representative. Uh, so if, you, if you have a sample that is effectively taken from one corner of the paddock where, product, where the crop's less or the pasture's you know, dominated by weeds or something, you're not going to get the answer. So you've got to make sure you get enough samples. You've got to also realise that because it's perishable, you've got to you've got to do a little bit more to, with it when you're handling compared to hay or grain. So, out the recommendation um, from this program and also from like the feed labs is you seal it and freeze it. So grab your samples in a plastic bag, squash the air out, seal it off, and then freeze it so that you've got a nice cold product when you start to deliver it. Check with the lab about delivery, but you don't want it to deteriorate in transit. So if you send it on a Thursday afternoon and it gets there to the lab on a Saturday, you know that will sit around potentially in the sun until Monday morning. So it's, it's not going to be a good go to the end of it. And samples do turn up with labs just won't or, or are unable to analyse because of that. The other thing I would say is... Um, it's worth giving them a ring because I'll probably give you a few recommendations. 
on what are the good carriers or whatever. And a lot of the labs have their own packaging system. So, for example, the New South Wales DPI's FQ, fee quality service, FQS, it has bags which you can get from your local land services and other places, and they will that will have all the details about how to handle it, how to send it, and it will be prepaid as far as I understand it for delivery to the lab. Yeah, just got a question there from Scott. I might might get to that in a second if I can. Now, when when we're feed testing, look the the, the ones we I consider important. The first one, the second one, and the third one, dry matter, ME, and protein are no different to any other product, whether it's hay, grain, or whatever. Dry matter allows you to formulate your rations because everything, energy, and proteins in that dry matter. The only thing to be aware of is when you get an, a dry matter from a silage test, it will, t it will be adjusted to include volatile components so for example when when you take a silage sample and you dry it there will be a loss of water but there will also be a lot of, of volatile compounds which for example alcohol um, and they they contain energy but they're blown they, they're just driven away during heating so they'll adjust that but it's it's relatively minor and by the time you get to 50 percent dry matter it's nothing Energy, protein, uh, self-explanatory. The two that are of value of, for silage are pH, which indicates how much acid is produced, and ammonia nitrogen. It's percent of total nitrogen. So the, the question is, thoughts on drying a sample down before sending, impact on ammonia values. Ammonia is volatile. So we'll see in a minute that ammonia has is something we want to know if we've dried it down beforehand, it's it's you're going to lose that ammonia. When you get to the lab, pH and ammonia are tested on the fresh solids. So no, don't dry it down before sending it. Um, in terms of sampling, look, I know it is very very difficult to sample a solids bone accurately because you've got to really wait until it's open. It, it I know people have talked about options for digging holes and cutting plastic, but it, but it's very difficult, um, and it's difficult to reseal. So really, you're talking about the silage is open and you measure it. Get a sample, you know, 12 grabs across the face, and make it sure it's representative. Um, with bales, the only thing you can do is probably same thing. Get a call from 10, 12 bales because individual bales can vary quite a bit from spot to spot. I often get asked, um, what do I think about um, sampling beforehand, before it actually goes into the pit or into the bowl? And I would, I would be quite supportive of that because I'd say, if you really want to know what the energy and protein of the, the material you're in, uh, in siling is, you're going to get a very, very good and accurate sample by going across and, and sampling the paddock just before it's picked up, either by the baler or the harvester. What you won't get, though, is the silage pH and ammonia, which indicate fermentation quality. Now, you can, you can take the punt and say, my silage, when I open it, is really, really good, so therefore I don't need it. Or you can, you can get another analysis done just to confirm and you'll get that fermentation quality. What you will also notice is the dry matter content, once adjusted, probably won't vary very much. ME content will have probably gone down a little bit because of the loss of energy during fermentation, the fermentation losses. And protein will actually probably have gone up a little bit. Protein doesn't go anywhere. Protein is just uh, nitrogen, as we know. They measure nitrogen, predict the crude protein. Nitrogen stays there. So if there's a loss of dry matter, the amount of nitrogen proportionally is a bit higher. So, yeah, silage pH and ammonia nitrogen. They are the ones that are going to tell you how palatable it is. So you've got an idea of the quality, um, either going in or at the time, and these will tell you how much they'll eat. The silage pH one is really only relevant to chop silages because you'll see there 
this is uh, out of out of the manual, but you'll see that um, it goes up to about 35% dry matter content. pH doesn't really work for bale silages because they're so dry. You'll also notice there that legumes will have a slightly higher pH. That's because of the lower sugar content in legumes and the higher buffering com content in legumes compared to grasses. But this, and if you if you look. Um, this is about the one example that compares bale and chopped silages at the same dry matter content. So dry matter has an impact on fermentation. You'll see there that this is a loosened silage and it was either a bale just put in a bag or chopped silage which was put in a bag. And you'll notice there the pH, so the rate, the uh, the um, amount of acid produced drops um, quite steeply for the chopped down to about four and a half and then slowly to you know just under four and a half whereas the um, unchopped material the bale itself drops reasonably to a five and a half and then it's a very slow decline and after 60 days the pH is still higher whether that has any impact on anything else the protein quality or anything is is unknown but what it means is that pH for bale silages apart from the higher dry matter content and I should have said this is at 39% dry matter this this example so it's sort of in, in between it, it will lead to a spurious pH value so let's look at the main one which is ammonia and this is and we did look talk, talk about this briefly in other webinars, you've got so much nitrogen, less than 5% is excellent, 5 to 10 is good, 10 to 15 is moderate, and greater than 15 is poor. So that's saying that as a percentage of total nitrogen, and we did talk about this under the quality bit, um, fifth, greater than 15%, you will get markedly lower intakes. So... If it was up to me, I would say I want to get a really good exa example. I'll probably take a, a, a sample at the time I baled or chopped the material. And then I would have an idea of the quality in terms of ME and protein and dry matter of the material I've installed, which would allow me to make some predictions about what I can use it for and preparations for what I may need to supplement with it. So for example, if it turns out that the ME is 9 and you really needed something that was 10, you know that regardless of the fermentation quality, you're going to probably have to get some grain. So when you embark on your feeding program, you'll have that grain there ready to go. Alternatively, I would still say get the silage quality at the time you're about to feed or, or have opened the bun because that's going to tell you um, what the quality of the uh, fermentation is and how likely is it to perform as you hope it will. So both of them are good. One final table about sheep. This is this is um, data that's, again, it's, it's produced overseas. And you'll see dry matter content's low. But what, what's happened here uh, is the silage fermentation is quite good, as indicated um, by the pH in, in the good silage and quite poor in the 4.5, but by 4.5 in the poor silage. Now, the way they would have achieved that good silage at that low dry matter content would have been the use of an acid. Now, it could have been sulfuric acid or, or formic acid, probably it's more likely formic acid. You'll see the difference in terms of ammonia levels. So where it was poor, 11.2% versus 5.7% in the good silage, relative dry matter intake. So the good silage supported 15% more intake. If you consider um, that all that 15% is going into production, assuming all maintenance is taken care of by that 100%, so if you you know seventy percent um, seventy percent is used for maintenance, 
of the 100. So you've got 30% for production versus 45% for production in the good silage. That would mean that your rate of weight gain would be 50% higher on that good silage. Doesn't look a big difference, but if you think of it in that, those terms, that, that is how you, would, you need to think about it. If you look at cattle, again, um, same or a similar scenario, pH is 4.8 versus 4.2 in the good, 18 versus 17 from the poor and the good. Dry matter intake, this time is a percent of live weight, 1.4 versus 1.9. Live weight gain, 0.47 versus 0.9. So the increase in intake is only 0.5 or half a percent of live weight, but the weight gain is effectively doubled or almost doubled the weight gain. Same scenario. Everything in the terms of additional intake is going into production so and not maintenance. So that's why you're getting the result that you're getting there. Now a question from Daryl, do legume silages need more or less wilting? For baled silages um, that are produced at 40 to 45 uh, percent, sorry 45 to 50 uh, percent, it's they're all at a very very safe level so they, they're you wilt to the same degree, not a problem. For chopped silages I would recommend legumes be 35 to 40 percent dry matter content at chopping whereas you could get away with slightly wetter for easier to install um, materials with such a higher sugar cereals or whatever but remembering that for example immature oats is difficult to install so you would need to to um have it at that 35 to 40% dry matter content. So it, it's a little bit dependent on what the material is. And so if you look at that table of insolability that we had before, which is online in the manual, um, you'll see, and, and pretty much 30 is your cutoff, never get below it, but from 30 to 35, how good you go will probably be, you'll go less good for, for harder to insolve silages, your fermentation quality be relatively poorer. Similarly, if you go a little bit under 30, you can probably get away with it for some things, certainly for things like um, sweet sorghum, which are 30% sugar, you, you're going to probably get away with that. So it's it's a, for bales in your case, they're the same. Um, in, in if, but if you stick as a rule of thumb to everything over 35%, you will be fine. Just make sure for hard to compact things like cereals, you don't go too far over 35 because it, it's a little bit hard once you get over 40. Now, I've got two more slides. Um, and so if anyone has got any quick questions um, before we finish, Please type them in now. Look, there, there is, and this is something else you can do. Just if if you're looking at a silage, um, there is some information you can get by just looking at a silage. It's not the same as a lab test. It's not going to provide all the data, and so I would strongly advise you get a lab test. But there are occasions where it may come in handy. For example, if you're looking at a silage and you and you find that it's obviously very, very mature at cutting, you know, it's got a lot of stem, it's got a lot of seed heads, hasn't got a lot of leaf in it, maybe a lot of grass, very little legume, and you're looking to buy um, silage, and we're usually talking about bales that's going to meet a certain criteria in terms of ME and protein, it's probably pretty apparent that that one's not going to. So... If you're looking to purchase it, you might say, look, sorry, that doesn't meet my requirements. I'm not going to bother to pay for a feed test because it doesn't make it. You can obviously tell if it's too wet or too dry. Um, but again, you know, for bales, it should never be too wet. Um, well, yeah, hopefully it should never be too wet. Um, too dry it should, is... Um, yeah, usually more evidenced by the fact that you can see moulds and stuff, which is if you look at it here, you know, if there's moulds present, um, 
you know, heirs entered the bail, so you've got losses. So then you can start to say, again, with a bit of QA for your system, what's going wrong here? Um, is it warm? You know, that means the spoilage is currently happening, not the moulds have damaged it in the past, but it's currently happening. One that people often don't think of is colour. And it's a little bit tricky because we say that if it's a brown colour, it's, it can be a, an indicator of heat damage. But we have to take it with a little bit of caution because there are some plants, some foragers, for example, subclover, that often go a brown colour when they ferment and they're in good nick. Um, you know, get that, they get that look of tobacco about them. Um, the reason we don't want brown, though, is the heating. And we talked about it before. If Same deal. If you're looking at a silage and it's gone quite brown and it's it, pretty obvious it's an indication it's been heated, either probably not opt to, to use that silage or, more importantly, if you do, make sure that when you get a feed test, you get a feed test that will give you the amount of acid detergent insoluble nitrogen. It's more expensive, but as we discussed previously, if you get heating, some of the protein will bind to some of the fibre in the feed. It will make the protein less available and it will make the fibre less available. It's, it's a reaction which is, is it's just a heat-induced binding of the two components, but the bacteria in the room aren't able to really break those bonds apart. So... Rule of thumb, if it's over 12% of the nitrogen in the form of acid detergent, insoluble nitrogen, it has been heated, and so you would have had some losses. And certainly if you're getting up to 20 and 30%, then you've got to really consider whether that feed is any of any value. Like you might have 15% protein, but if 30% of that is, in, is unavailable, you're effectively knocking that down to um, whatever that is, seven, ten and a half percent, effectively. So now I have one question here from Rod: If in soiling square bales, does boiling twine get removed before compaction or before um, feed out? So really, just remove the bale strings at exactly the same time as you would when you're feeding out bales of hay. So they'll go into the pit, they'll stay there, and you need them so you can handle them pretty comfortably um, for not just in removal but, but later on. And then I'd remove them just as you start to feed out or whatever. And I think, Sue, that's probably about me, unless there's any more questions. No worries. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to you, John, um, for your collaboration with these webinars. It was um, fantastic for you to share your knowledge with all of us. Um, and thank you, Sophia, for all your help um, using this um, platform. It really was nice not to have to facilitate um, and do the webinar all at the same time. Um, and a huge thank you to all of you for participating in these webinar series. Um, we hope that you all got something out of it. Um, I know I did. Um, and I just want to say don't forget that um, if you haven't registered um, for these series, um, the webinar will be available on the LLS website. All you need to do is go onto the LLS website and that is www.lls.nsw.gov.au slash silage webinars and they'll be accessible there. So like I said, thanks again to John and Sophia for all your help and thank you everyone for um, participating in these silage workshops and we all hope you got something um, out of these webinars. But also thank you to Sue um it was Sue's initiative to start trying to put together some silage stuff based on what the season was going, looking like and uh, she's put a bit of a fair bit of effort into it. So thank you, Sue. And thank you, everybody who turned, turned up and listened. <laughs>